It's my pleasure to introduce the, the final session of the conference, which is a really hope it's going to be a very interesting conference uh, panel discussion. Just before I do, I want to congratulate Monica and all the team involved in delivering the conference. It's been really great and so special uh, this year. I'm joined up here by, uh, I'm very grateful to colleagues who agreed to participate in the session. Melissa and Chris need no introduction, but um, over on my far left now we have uh, Professor Patrick Ryan, and I'm delighted Patrick has joined us from University of Limerick, where he is the Vice President for Student Engagement, uh, and in this role he has responsibility for key services that serve to enhance the student experience at UL, including Student Affairs, the Glucksman Library, the Centre for Transformative Learning, and Cooperative Education and Careers. Patrick also has oversight of conference and chancellor liaison duties, and he holds a doctorate in clinical psychology from Queen's and previously worked in the HSE before entering academia. So we're very glad that Patrick has joined us this afternoon, as well, obviously, as uh, our wonderful keynotes, Chris and Melissa, fr from uh, yesterday and today. Um, so the topic of the, of the discussion in, your, in the program is the future of higher education research and, and, uh, and uh, the role of, of libraries in that. And we've had a discussion earlier about it, and I guess we've come up with a few areas that we want to talk about and think we have some interesting things to say about it. And we're going to start, I guess, with a question for, um, uh, for Patrick. But, you know, we've been through a turbulent couple of years, and now we're hopefully coming out the other, the other side. We all know COVID hasn't gone away, but certainly its impact has lessened. But now, what, you know, the changes that it's led to in terms of students have expectations, what does that mean for HE and what does it mean for libraries? So maybe, Patrick, do you want to take that first? One of the things that's happened to us all during the pandemic, and particularly when we were locked down, um, was that sense of questioning, what's, what's everything about? And is there any meaning and purpose to anything, or is it full of meaning and purpose? And I, I think from a student engagement perspective, students are presenting us with challenges around um, how we do our work, uh, where we do it, um, the, the functionality of the work that we engage in, its purpose, its meaning. Um, and I, for me, you know, one of the key things about engaging with students and, and student users of all services is trying to get into their shoes and understand the perspective that they now bring. And of course, for many of our, our younger students, they've missed out on key developmental transitions and learning experiences that, 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 that they would normally bring to, um, bring to campus. So we've, students are challenging us in some way to reimagine redefine what we do and how we do it. Um, and I suppose, particularly for students who haven't had experiences of uh, tertiary education, they come with an expectation that we all know, because we've obviously done this before. And of course, we all sit around and discuss over Zoom and Teams about what we don't know. And, and one of the things that the pandemic has taught us is that we know so little um, when Mother Nature decides to come after us. So I think we have to manage expectations from students that we've got all the answers. We've got to manage their need for certainty and guarantee, which has been really badly shaken for them at a very key developmental age for younger, younger students. And we've also got to manage the message that we give back to those who use our services so that we don't lead them into any fantasy that says, we've got all the answers, we know how to deliver, we sort all of this out for you. Um, and in that, there's another inherent challenge, which is how we then engage with these, uh, with, with these people as students, with these people as service users, with these people as consumers. How do we engage with them to deliver what we ultimately want to, want to, to deliver for them? So I think that there's a lot of expectation management um, we do have knowledge, we do have experience, but in some way the, the collective experience is about emerging out of something that none of us really were ever prepared for. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Patrick. And of course, this applies to staff too, uh, Chris. Well, let me follow up first. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you, but the, the message to a, a group of uh, folks who work in libraries that we have to admit that we don't have answers is a really <laughs> hard message for, <laughs> for librarians, right? To pride ourselves on as you come to us with questions and we give you the answer. But um, yeah, I think, I think that's such an excellent point about um, we don't know the answers. Nobody knows what, uh, what post-COVID is going to look like. We don't know yet what lessons we've learned. They haven't all 
fallen out yet. We haven't analyzed the data yet, and it's you know it's a pretty truncated amount of data at this point. Um, so I think that's a really, really um, important message and a hard one, I think, for people who work in higher ed. I mean, librarians especially, but probably everyone who works in higher ed would like to have answers. Um, you know, and, and our students expect us to have answers. And as leaders, our staff expect us to have answers. Um, but I, I think um, one of the things that's, uh, that I think is really important is as, as we start to reintroduce the in-person experience and the on-campus residential experience, I think pre-COVID, we sort of took for granted the fact that um, uh, both staff and students would kind of, they're on campus, we have this residential and, and in the office kind of experience, and um, the advantages of that just kind of were there. And we didn't have to think very hard about what should we be doing in per person and what should we be doing online. And I think we have to think much harder. We have to be very, very um, deliberate about what what is it about being in person and and um, you know being on a, on a campus that actually delivers value and how we maximize that, right? Because there is value. We learn that there is value and there are things we can do in an online environment to engage people. And this is where the staff question, I think, becomes relevant. Um, and my experience was that um, there were many, many um, settings in which the online experience was more engaging for staff. So for example, um, we would have all, all staff meetings, uh, you know, quarterly in, in the before times. And, you know, it was for all staff, but I'd probably get two-thirds of the staff there, and very few, very few people would ask questions, and it was always the same people. In the online environment, almost every, we had, you know, 80, 90% attendance, and huge engagement in the chat. I mean, just, Clear you know, chat. people who had n never felt comfortable in asking questions or engaging were now engaging, mm -hmm. right? So I think there's some really interesting things that we have to just be very nuanced about how we think about how to engage students and how to engage staff. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity, I think, to be able to take advantage of different modes of engagement. Which is not the answer that I said I was going to give. <laughs> <laughs> Flexibility, that's the key. Absolutely, yeah. And it is really interesting, and certainly that was our, uh, the experience you described is our experience at Maynooth as well, and I'm sure many of you can empathize with that too. Melissa, are you going to pick up on that? Yeah, I would say, I would echo that. So I'm going to say something about students as staff. So we have a, so we have a very international student body at the University of Edinburgh, and one of the expectations from them is that if they come, they become part of the university. And they were in a locked in bedrooms during COVID. And one of the things that they missed from the city was the ability to get part time job. I mean, you know, being able to work and study in the city and feel part of it was something that seemed to disappear because all of those jobs that were traditionally being done mm -hmm. by students disappeared. And so, one of the things that we did, which was also part of our uh, work very well for me in terms of quality and, and diversity of engagement, is so this is a much more diverse group, the student body. So we um, spent a lot of effort making sure that we created digital jobs that could be done from home, from your bedroom, and to be part of what was happening in the university. So we had 40 students in paid work, part-time jobs, helping us shift content from platform to platform, building new curricula in the, in the VLA, and getting into digital jobs that were perhaps also helped me with my pipeline. I mentioned about being a, a woman in tech. You know, I need to be developing a pipeline of a diverse group of people who have thought about having careers in learning technology. So anybody that I can tempt into a job. So we created a lot of um, jobs that were to do with learning technology, maybe doing captioning and subtitling on media, maybe helping to package stuff up and move it around, editing websites and such. And we sent out laptops to their uh, bedrooms and flats to make sure that they could um, take part in this jo these jobs. And when I bring that kind of diversity into my teams, of course, they are then, oh, and obviously we're continuing that. We do that every, we had done it in the summers before, and we did it particularly during COVID. But they, they return again and again. 
and some of them have now been with me for several summers uh, working in these jobs, but this is part of keeping them engaged and not losing them, and also their expectation that when they are so far from home, they will have access to a whole range of things in the university, and that really um, helped me with a, a workforce of people with a high level of, well, a high level of digital skill in some areas, but very little experience in learning technology or captioning or accessibility or any of those things. And I was also able to offer very similar opportunities to a certain amount of staff um, in the uh, libraries and the AV fit out techs who couldn't get onto campus. And so we moved quite a few people around into roles where they were doing transcription or uh, web editing or um, uh, content design, uh, building courses in the virtual learning environment, which I think was one of the benefits of being in a large converged service, that we're actually being able to be flexible with staff. So it kept a lot more people engaged who might have felt quite isolated and who might have disappeared, but also just gave me bonus in terms of diversifying my workforce. I get better services if I am involving the users of the services in the design and delivery of the services. So this was a great mm -hmm. opportunity uh, that we were able to do that. Great. And maybe I suppose building on from that then and particularly picking up on, 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 on some stuff there that, that uh, Chris and Patrick said about this uncertainty and no one knowing that, you know, we don't have the answer, it's a very uncomfortable place for librarians to be in. You know, how then can we sort of determine what should the priorities be for our institutions going forward? You know, if, if the world's that uncertain, how can we decide, you know, which, what things we should back and what things we should aim to support uh, for the future, if we're going to be ready for this post-pandemic world? Well, I suppose those are the areas that I would want to continue. So things like um, involving that group of people in de mm -hmm. designing services, several people have mentioned about the digital skills and the, um, a, uh, the VR and AR and the students' hunger for maker spaces and for new services that meet their needs in different ways. And I think that continuing to draw them in and make them part of our organization is really key. And I guess, you know, some people might say that's a whole bunch of additional jobs because this is paid work, but I think that investing in staff as students and diversifying the workforce hits some of those institutional targets for equality, diversity, and inclusion. Remember, you've got intersections of age and cross-generational working, which bring all kinds of benefits in your organization. Um, uh, but also, I mean, certainly in the tech area, there's a war for talent. You know, the great resignation is a whole bunch of people um, who are being snapped up by rock star games um, in my city, um, being offered much more sexy seeming work. Um, and so the more I can ensure that there's a pipeline of talent and that I don't, also that I don't lose um, women in tech from my leaky mm. pipeline, which I think that menopausal women find it much more comfortable to work from home with a <laughs> cushion behind your back and the ability to decide what temperature you were working in. And I, I'm hoping that we managed to keep some people during the pandemic that we might have lost traditionally in a toxic workplace. So a clear priority then around skills and people and so on. Chris, from your perspective, the priorities we should be looking at. Yeah, I, I mean, the same thing with a, a slightly different twist, right? I think the priority has to be the, the staff, right? I mean, um, yeah, I, in my talk, I talked about libraries being more than books and buildings, and really what they are is it's expertise, right? And, and the staff who work in libraries, the, the expertise that's needed in the, in the future Clearly, research is much more data intensive um, and continues to be, and so some data literacy amongst our staff. Um, you know, the, the, the AR and VR kind of um, engagements are, are gonna be important. Understanding computational research. Um, not, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that librarians have to suddenly become, you know, computer scientists, but we have to be conversant in that kind of research so we can support the work that's, that's mm -hmm. going on, the, the learning that our students are doing. And, and frankly, that requires an investment in, in both training and professional development and in salaries, frankly. I mean, we can't compete with rock star 
<laughs> yeah, and, then, and, then, and then within our own universities, we can't compete with the IT folks for talent. Um, so there's got to be an investment from our administration in understanding that um, the skills that they need from their library staff is, is much more technical um, than perhaps they realize. And you've got you've to invest in that. Patrick, what's your take on all that? And what would be your priorities for the, for the future? I think we have a, an opportunity um, to, to work with freeing up people to be really good learners, really good teachers, um, because we want to develop graduates who will go out and have a positive impact on society. So for me, in, the investment is in people um, in a way maybe that we've thought, uh, in a way that's different than what we've thought previously. Um, so the, the, the pandemic and lockdown created a whirlwind of various factors that seemed to be overwhelmingly negative at certain times and out of that came lots of positive. And, and one of the things for me that I've learned over the years in, in, in lots of different jobs that I've been in is that when there's a whirlwind of change in all this external environment, you need some pillars that stand very firmly and, and library is one of those for me and that's traditionally because the the library building you know was there in the center of 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 the campus and in some ways it becomes a physical marker of the identity of being in a particular in a particular institution at a particular time i think in with all the technological advances and vles um you know understanding big data what we still have to hold on to is that what will enable and facilitate learning and what will enable and facilitate good teaching is having a staff profile that's energized and motivated and dedicated to enhancing the human experience in that learning environment. So um, yes, we've got to understand all the variables that are around us that are changing, but we can equally hold on to what we're very, very good at and library services are very, very good because of their people at engaging with other people who are in need. And there's, we dispose of that caregiving um, at our peril. And yes, we need our library staff to be trained and educated in all of the new um, technologies that come our way so we can do that job better. And yes, more and more of us will work in a virtual world where the person that we're engaged with could be a thousand meters away or a thousand kilometers away. But actually, that point of connection and how any of us regulate that and nurture that will determine whether our students engage with us in the first place and whether they will see value in staying engaged with us so that they can go on and take the jobs that are on offer and that ultimately when they leave us they have a sense of well that's what it meant to be in that college at that time as a student and now as a graduate so there's something about investing in a social currency that in my view the library has always traded off of irrespective of how it did its particular, the, the functions of its particular work. Great, and I suppose we saw, we saw dr during the last couple of days, and even just when you're talking there now, there are these sort of tensions between some of these ideals, you know, the on-campus library, the, 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 the growing importance of going digital and so on. And it strikes me, and we were talking about this earlier, that one of the other throttles, I guess, of some of this change, and, and particularly what Melissa and, and Chris were talking about is, we're doing lots of things that we've always done, but now we're being expected to do, and we need to do all these other things. So, you know, from your perspective, are there things we could maybe consider stop doing or doing less of that um, would at least create some of that capacity? I know there's the skills dimension as well we talked about, but um, you know, are there things that we could that are currently part of our workload that we could maybe reduce or even dispense of? Can I can I jump in to respond to <laughs> and play devil's sure. advocate a little bit, if I may? Okay. Um, and I'm only partly playing, to be honest. Um, so I worry, a, I worry a little bit about um, piling the, the expectation of um, uh, sort of providing that social safety net onto the libraries, right? It's just, it's another, and, and, and I worry about it in part because we are such a feminized profession that we're looking to nurturing and caregiving to the women on campus most mostly 
and um, and we're not and and it's a it's an extra burden that we're sloughing off. I mean, I'm I'm being provocative on purpose, so go with me here. Um, it, you know, sloughing it off onto the the most feminized and in fact some of the lowest paid professionals on our campus, and uh, and 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 we're expected to do that, and the faculty are also expecting us to you know make sure that that we have all the books they want and all the databases they want and all the expertise that they need to to navigate a, a much more complex knowledge environment, and by the way, to help negotiate open access uh, contracts with our publishers and help them navigate that. And now you also want us to be counselors. I, I don't feel good about that. Yeah, some, help me out here, anybody yeah. else? <laughs> okay. <'Cause laughs> well, hopefully we'll have time in a moment to come to, to the floor, but you know, I thought it goes go speaks to the question, Patrick. Like apart from the, 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 the some of the issues that Chris raised there, like from your perspective, are there parts of what we're doing that we could reconsider, even if it you know as part of a response to, to the issues Chris raised, but also in general to sort of prepare us for that shift that we need to make. I, th I think we need to, you know, what we all want to do is is give the best experience to the people that use our services. So what blocks us? And so much of our time and energy is devoted to regulation and framework and and you know if we look at the the old style uh, the, the the old profile of the library was it was a guardian of knowledge and you had to apply to be able to get in and whether that was the local library or the one in in your college so there's something in my head about freeing up all of the knowledge that we we generate as researchers and teachers and all the experiences um, so much of our time is devoted to trying to you know, get better value licenses and then protecting entry to the license and, and, and that. So maybe one of the things we need to shake up radically is how much of the custodian, the protector that we need to be. Um, and having a look at the, the wider landscape of how do we make knowledge much more freely available um, so that people who come from disadvantaged uh, parts of society have as much opportunity and the likelihood of them being able to access that knowledge that can go on to enhance their lives, um, that that's there. So I think somewhere, somewhere over the course of the next decade, we, I'd love to see that argument happening about, you know, we talk about open license and open access, but actually so, many of the, so much of the work that many of us do is about blocking off people who are not allowed. And what's the, what, are, what is the set of ethics that guides that? What's the morality? that guides that type of, of, of function and purpose. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, just going back to you, Chris, a little bit, that library and, and my experience of library and all of the staff in library has always been about trying to enable me to do something that I've sort of failed to do, or often I was too lazy to try and work out how to do it. Um, and my, I think the point I was trying to make was rather than put an extra burden, it's about trying to access something that comes naturally to many people who work in a library setting, which is about seeing an issue and enabling somebody else to overcome that in a way that allows them to do it themselves the next time. So I'd sooner tap into that and capture it rather than say, here's a new job definition, library counselor, um, and add it in as an extra burden. There's something about the library being at the heart and soul of how any campus and how any library or how any institution works and being able to use that as the the solid pillar that didn't move even in the midst of all the lockdown and the pandemic it actually was the lighthouse it stayed open virtually and in reality it stayed while all the rest of us ran up to the attic and had to hide and then work away on our laptops so i think what i'm trying to do is tap into the one part of that educational experience that held very solid and in a world that just whirls this is this is the hub chris i know you you want to come back on that <laughs> <laughs> or indeed melissa can you help me out melissa <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think that stayed open is interesting as well because you know do we mean the buildings and there was a lot of staff who were yeah who were forced back onto campus because they worked in the library at a time before the vaccines were safe and we'd spent a lot of time talking about dwell time and how fast you had to move through and 
I mean, we are certainly in the UK in a period of sustained industrial action, and um, some of that was to do with the feeling that the employers were taking advantage, I think, of particular groups of staff for some of the reasons that um, you couldn't possibly leave the students um, or you couldn't possibly do without these services. But I, I mean, I don't know, as a service provider, to me, a, a service catalogue is important and knowing the difference between library services and counselling services and study spaces are not all the same thing. And although library buildings have their lights on and are a place that you can go and the door, date, the door um, entry systems mean that members of the... I mean, I un absolutely understand the experience of when you're a student, sense of belonging and going to spend time in the library building where it's you and the other students and you're having that experience of shared pain at exam time that everybody there is going through this same thing and I think that that's very important. I don't know if it's essential to have library books in the building at the same time if it's yeah. about architecture and about, you know I think there's I think unpicking sense of belonging and connections is something that and well-being is something that we absolutely have to do as a result of COVID and we shouldn't make a cultural capital assumption about what we think libraries are for, particularly if we're talking about the library of the future. And several people have mentioned a two-year impact of COVID means there's a whole bunch of people, somebody spoke very well about this, that there's a whole bunch of people who will never have experienced the before times ways of studying, for, although the faculty all will, and we will remember right. how it used to be. But there's a, been a disruption, a hiccup, which means that um, certainly phrases like virtual learning environment, honestly, I did spend some time in Oculus Quest recently, and I thought, <laughs> I, I loved it. Yeah. Anyway, but I thought, if this is what they think a virtual learning environment, and it took me no, t you know, no time to learn, there was no instructions, and you know, so I was just, I was just, yeah. I thought, if this, if they think this is what a virtual environment is, they're going to get a shock. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, Chris, yeah. 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 you want to come yeah. back there? Yeah. Um, so, so let me uh, go to the, the theme of the conference, right? The uh, library of the future, the future is now. And I think that for so many of us, our libraries are already so much more than a service point, right? I mean, we, yes, we do. We always have. We provide great service, blah, blah, blah. Um, but frankly, we're much more proactive than that. We are more than a service. We are true partners and experts and, and scholars in our own right and activists in our own right. And, and I think it's really important. Um, you know, I, I chafe a little bit at the idea that the library is this unmovable thing. My God, libraries have changed so much in the last 20 years and then in the last two years. And I can't, I can't, you know, I, I can imagine, I did um, yesterday morning, what the library of the future looks like. And it is not the, the building, you know, the, the, the mecca on the hill, um, you know, the oracle of knowledge that people go to to be awe-inspired. Um, we, are, we are much more mobile and nimble and, and proactive than that. Um, and I think that's, that's what's going to give you the identity that allows other to, to others to link to uh, w in their world, which was which is changing so rapidly and can often feel overwhelming. It's it's that nimbleness. It's that ability to be flexible. It's that ability to adapt and and to lead. I think is ultimately where I see it as. Now I yeah, happen yeah. personally to love the idea of building <laughs> with it, um, but I'm not for any. You know, I don't at all entertain the notion that it's it's stuck. It's one of those solid um, forces, but it moves, and it often moves ahead. I mean, I'm very aware yeah. in our university in Limerick how library is often ahead in terms of being able to see the horizon and put on the education, put on the training programs for staff and students. So it's it's not like a a nod to some relic, it, but it is actually saying that if we want our students to stay engaged with us and to become the best learners so that they optimize their talent, then library is one, there are some others, but it's one and a main one that can absolutely lead the way in how to do this. 
by being nimble, flexible, adaptable, and changing. But somehow, at the same time, it feels like it's pretty solid. I'm going to, actually going to stop you there because that's been a really good, interesting discussion. But I do want to give the delegates a chance to engage us. And we're unfortunately, we're very short on time. Uh, so we do have a few minutes for questions, maybe one or two questions. If there are questions and comments on what you've heard, we've managed to pick up, I think, on a lot of the themes that have been touched on over the last couple of days. Um, but as I said, I do really want to give you a chance to uh, contribute now. So please, any one or two quick questions. Alan, thank you. Thanks, Carl. Uh, I can't believe I'm about to do this. I have more of a comment than a question. <laughs> but here goes. Uh, I, I just need to say that Chris is absolutely right. We cannot. Well, that's a brilliant comment. We <laughs> <laughs> Drop the mic. Uh, we can't become counsellors. Um, and I, I don't think that's necessarily what you're suggesting that we should do. But I think what we need from folks like yourself in university leadership is to recognise, as you did, that our library staff were the last to leave and the first to return, and that we need resources for what we're currently doing, what our existing remit currently is. And we just don't have enough of those resources right now. And we do need folks like yourself to advocate and to strengthen and to back the role of the library as it currently is. My sense is that if we weaken or diversify the role of the library to be something I, I think we're like a rubber band we can stretch and snap and i think it's important that we recognize that we are changing i think that we've seen two days here of the best of our library staff in this country innovating constantly pivoting constantly i use the p word so yeah, that's my comment. Uh, thank you for your comments, but it's my plea, I suppose, to help us elevate the story of the library and what we're doing really well right now. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm am I on? Yeah, uh, I'm Lindsay from TU Dublin. Um, just uh, two quick things, Carl. You, just one of the things that you mentioned about what could we possibly be doing less of. And I just want to say that I think Stuart made some very interesting points around how long we actually need to be open in this day and age. And perhaps if we had um, some more comments about the sustainability of opening hours and front of house services, that we could pivot. Um, my question is for Patrick. Um, and again, it, is, it does relate back to your point about the nurturing role of the library and the potential gendered nature of that comment, which you may or may not be aware of, but it did feel quite gendered. And I just wonder that would you uh, give the same advice and have the same expectations of a male dominated workplace? Um, so if there was any gendered uh, uh, implication, I didn't mean a gender. Uh, that wasn't my, my point at all. I, nurturing for me is a, it's a concept that can be delivered by anybody. Um, so my comment was coming from a place of watching how library services have been able to see what the difficulties are that students engage in their educational journey and library staff have the qualifications, the experience, the know-how to be able to alleviate that. That's my definition of nurturing in that educational sense. Um, it's, it's a much broader concept than simply the the traditional gendered act of nurturing, which we've which we've come to understand, so that's that's where I come from with that. So, if there was any gendered in, uh, implication, I that wasn't intended. Okay, maybe just one very quick one. Thanks, Patrick. One very quick question. I'm getting the warning here. My red light. Okay, Kira McCaffrey from the University of Limerick, and because the library reports into Patrick, I agree with everything Patrick said. <laughs> but I would like to say, to just give the, because uh, it's a really interesting discussion about the library and its role, and we're not counsellors, and the gender um, discussion really makes it very interesting. But I would like to just reiterate what I said yesterday. The library has a strong role in student well-being. We do. We're not counsellors, but we are a sanctuary for them. We're a, an oasis for them and a total sanctuary during um, COVID. 
And that's really important for us to understand. We are not counsellors, we, we don't have that expertise, but we can do more in the space of providing well-being for our students. So more a comment than a question. Chris, Chris, I have a quick uh, comment from Chris on that. So, so I actually agree, and I agree with you, that that's a place where the libraries should be seen as leaders. So it's less that the university should be relying more on the libraries for that, but you should be copying us, imitating us. Yep. And, and that sense of well-being and that sense of a, being a place that is, you know, sort of safe and inclusive and welcoming should spread across campus. Not not located solely in the libraries. Let us lead on that. Don't rely on us to do the to, do to only be the only ones, but let us lead and spread that. Okay. Well, if I can suggest, that's a nice note yep. to finish on. Um, look, it's a sign of a good discussion when it feels terrible has been cut short. So I just want to ask you to please show your appreciation for Patrick, Melissa, and Chris for this great event. Now we'll come back over to Monica.